A little while ago, we chatted about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's hotel expenses in London during the Queen's funeral. Stories were circulating of a $6,000 per night room with a butler service. Well, now more information has come to light about that trip. To talk about it in more detail is our political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. So, Brian, what have you learned? We learned that uh, that story sent the government into a bit of a tizzy. They didn't know how to respond. They didn't know what to say. Um, I did an access to information request on, on, on communications within the days after the story broke. And we saw, you know, because if you remember back, I was asking for days for a response from Global Affairs Canada because PMO wouldn't tell us anything. PMO said, talk to GAC. GAC didn't respond, we found out, because they felt PMO had answered. They never answered who stayed in the uh, the $6,000 a night hotel room. Uh, you know, we've got redacted documents back on that. Uh, we saw uh, lines drafted to respond to my questions and then a, an order from the minister's office not to respond to me at all. Uh, that was part of it. But also uh, discussion among senior civil servants at Global Affairs of what does this mean for the coronation of King Charles this coming May? And you know, should we reduce numbers was part of the dis uh, discussion. They decided not to, but it does look like the uh, the prime minister and the governor general will be in separate hotel rooms to make the overall bill smaller and to not make it look quite as opulent. So it'll be interesting to see where they go. Look, they, they have to go to these events. Nobody's saying they don't. But a $6,000 a night, three-bedroom suite with Butler, just for the Prime Minister, that that makes no sense at all. Um, you know, the, you could have stayed in, in all kinds of beautiful uh, hotel suites for far less than what the, uh, the, the Prime Minister paid for that one. And I'm assuming, even though they won't tell us, I am assuming that it is the Prime Minister because that's the only place that hasn't answered with, clearly on... Uh, on, on were they there. And it appears as though the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is also getting in on the act and they're looking for answers too. Yeah, so they're uh, saying they're going to launch uh, legal action because they submitted their own access to information request and, and they got back documents showing that the government has the answer of who stayed in that room, but they won't release it. And it's an abuse of the situation. And I'm experiencing that, how with other hotel documents that I received. So after the prime minister left the Queen's funeral, he flew to New York, he went to the United Nations General Assembly. We wanted the hotel expenses. They redacted the name, the address, any identifying features that could tell you what the hotel room, uh, what the hotel was. They even redacted how many rooms were booked. So we get a total cost. We know that there were uh, executive suites, junior suites. There were rooms that were booked for storage of equipment and furniture. That's all fine. It's part of the cost of, of traveling with a large entourage. But, you know, we, we don't know uh, an awful lot of other details. And the government's claiming security. I'm sorry. It, it's not security either on this one or the one that uh, where they stayed for the, the uh, Queen's funeral. The events already happened. It's in the past. There is no security aspect to this. So the government is just embarrassed that the $6,000 a night hotel room, which, by the way, if you use the real exchange rate, is more than $7,000 a night for wow. five nights. Wow. Um, they're embarrassed by this story, and they're starting to block the release of information that you and I as taxpayers have the right to know. So much for government transparency. Brian, let's talk about the Premier's recent meeting with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau discussing an increase in health care funding. Uh, the tenure offer is on the table. Will the Premier's accept? Do you think maybe there will be some counter offers? Uh, they're going to accept, and we've known that from the beginning. Um, you know, there is an attempt uh, led by Ontario Premier Doug Ford to try and get some language added that will... Um, as Ford say, uh, said in, in a recent news conference, just assure the premiers that they're, you know, there's not going to be a fiscal cliff that they fall off of. Some of the pots of money were set up. It, you know, it's a 10-year deal, but some of the pots are for four years. Some are for five, but they're for programs that are supposed to continue on, such as, I'll give you an example. Um, the federal government wants to put forward money so that every province and territory can increase the hourly wage of personal support workers. Okay, well, that's great. But if you're only going to fund that for five years, what happens in year six? 
That's what the premiers want to know. They know they're not going to get blood out of a stone from the federal government. They're not going to get the 35% funding, the $28 billion extra. They're going to get this. Part of the reason they're going to take it is, you know, how do you turn around and say to the electorate, uh, I turned down more money for health care. Say Premier Danielle Smith, she's got an election in May. She cannot, uh, she can complain and say the federal government needs to do more, but she can't turn down this money and then go into an election against Rachel Notley, who'll be saying, you got offered money for health care and you said no. Yeah, May 29th is a pretty big day here in the province. Brian, the ethics commissioner has called for senior liberals to receive some ethics training after yet another liberal was found a breach of the act. Tell me more. Yeah, I think this is number nine. Uh, we're talking about Greg Fergus. He's a liberal MP from uh, the Quebec side of the Ottawa River, so Gatineau, Elmer area. He, um, he lobbied on behalf of a TV station uh, to the CRTC. He went above and beyond what he's supposed to do as an MP. Um, so he was found in violation. And, you know, that just came this week at a time when, uh, and Greg Fergus is a parliamentary secretary, um, but Mary Ng, who's the Minister for International Trade, is currently under fire for her violation of the Ethics Act, where she gave uh, contracts to a friend, very cozy contracts. And you know how, at first I wasn't overly exercised by this, um, a liberal hiring, a liberal to do communications work. Yeah, they're not going to hire a conservative to consult them on how to communicate with the public. But then I, I saw some of the testimony, and in particular, the interrogation by conservative MP Michael Barrett of Minister Ain, where she just walked through with very firm, but simple questions of who was on this training? What did the training consist of? Were there presentations made, slide decks, even asked if there were laminates put on an overhead projector, for those of you old enough to remember that technology. None of that was there. The couple of pages of paper that were submitted on, here's what we'll do on training, but it was uh, $17,000 just about for two Zoom calls with Minister Ain's best friend. I mean, they've been friends for 20 years. They talk all the time. This is an egregious uh, abuse of taxpayer money. Um, and Ain didn't recuse herself from making the decision. So sole sourced to her friend, I can't tell what the work was, but I can tell you that that is exactly what we did see is exactly the type of work that political staffers normally do. Ain has four political communication staff plus 100 bureaucrats working in her department that could have done this work for her. And I can tell you right now, the Zoom call is not costing us 17 grand. So thanks for that. I appreciate that. Brian, we recently spoke about Roxham Road and how officials in New York City are allegedly busing people up to the Canadian border. Now, apparently, Quebec is busing people to Ontario. What's going on here? Uh, Premier Francois Legault says his province is full. He can't take any more people. Over this past weekend, there were 380 people between Saturday and Sunday who crossed the border. Think about that. In December, it was an average of 151 people per day. 380 over two days, Hal. That's far bigger. Guess what? Only eight of them stayed in Quebec, according to the Quebec government. They told the, the feds two things. One, you've got to talk to New York and tell them to stop. Premier Legault also wrote a letter to New York Mayor Eric Adams telling him that this was unacceptable and he needs to stop. But uh, Legault also told the, uh, the, the prime minister and the federal government, you need to uh, deal with this. One, we need to send people to other provinces. So uh, last time this was a big issue. A lot of people came to Ontario. Others went to New Brunswick. Expect to see that uh, continue to climb. We haven't heard from the Ontario government on this yet, but we expect to. Uh, but, he, you know, he's also pressuring the, the federal government to stop this, to discourage this. This is not regular immigration. This is not regular refugee flow. These are people uh, being shuffled around either due to the American problems where they fly into JFK directly from around the world, immediately get on a bus, head to Plattsburgh, and then get in a cab to Roxham Road. Uh, th this is uh, people being used and abused with the promise that this, this will work. Most of the claims are rejected. We need to discourage this. We need to stop it. U.S. President Joe Biden's recent State of the Union address appeared quite protectionist in tone. How much does that mindset, Brian, really threaten Canadian jobs and industry? I mean, keeping in mind, Donald Trump appeared to have a very similar tone when he was president. 
if Donald Trump was more protectionist than Obama and Obama was more protectionist than George W. Bush, Biden's more protectionist, protectionist than all of them. And it threatens everything from softwood lumber in British Columbia and uh, Quebec to uh, meat producers, uh, be it pork in Quebec or uh, cattle in Alberta. It threatens the auto industry. It threatens manufacturing, steel, because he wants everything in American infrastructure projects to be made in America. This really needs to be dealt with. It needs to be tackled. And the Trudeau government has fallen asleep. They were all hands on deck during the Trump years. They need to get back to that. They need to be on, a, on an aggressive footing. Because while Sleepy Joe does it with a smile, he is more protectionist than all the other presidents. Brian, let's talk about balloons now for a minute, in particular Chinese spy balloons and some unidentified flying objects that have been shot down over North America. Does Ottawa really have a good handle on what's going on here? Uh, no, but, you know, at least uh, Defence Minister Anita Anand was willing to say she didn't think they were extraterrestrial. Uh, an American general caused quite a stir by saying, I haven't ruled anything out. And everyone said, oh, so they're aliens. Um, they didn't tell us about the first balloon uh, until it was already in the United States. Uh, the second balloon was shot down before it got to our airspace. It was shot down uh, over Alaska. The third one, it, it was flying so low that it was a danger if, if commercial aircraft were in the area. It was at about 40,000 feet. That's getting into the commercial aircraft range. So, uh, no, I don't think they've got a handle on it. We, we ended up with one shot over Lake Huron, um, closer to the Michigan side, but near the Canadian border. And I'm going to bet that at some point that balloon was in Canadian airspace. So NORAD is missing some of these. <clears throat> Politically, uh, this is causing a great strain uh, between both uh, Ottawa and Washington and Beijing. A lot of accusations going back and forth. I spoke to a, a gentleman who is a, a China analyst uh, named uh, Bill Bishop, and he said, he has never seen the relationship between Washington and Beijing so strained uh, that uh, this is uh, China flexing its muscle but denying it's doing so. Now you've got Taiwan saying that they're going to shoot down anything that floats over their territory. This has the potential to really ratchet up tensions, um, put us in a dangerous position. Uh, I, I, you know, if these are coming from the Chinese government or being allowed to happen. Uh, China says they're from a private company and they're weather balloons. I don't believe that. But if it's from a private company, they're allowing it to happen. They need to stop. They need to, to tone things down. Brian, the final report from the Emergencies Act inquiry will be released next Monday. But it will come on a day that neither the House of Commons nor the Senate are sitting. Will the public or Canadians in general still get a chance to see Justice Rouleau's report? It's an odd day for it to be released. It's a, it's a holiday here in Ontario. It's family day. Um, and it, you know, it's a holiday in various provinces, depending on uh, where you live. Alberta as well, yeah, you bet. But, but the, the, the House is not sitting, and the House and the Senate both reside in Ontario. I'm told that the, the report will still be released. It will still be made public. I'm not sure how. Um, you know, it's a, it's a provincial holiday, but federal workers still always take it from my memory of uh, my many years in Ottawa. So uh, we're expected to see it. If you recall, originally the order in council setting this up said you will give it to cabinet on February 6th and you will deliver it to both houses of parliament uh, on February 20th. So that was going to give the government a two week head start. That didn't happen, thankfully. Uh, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of outrage over that, giving the government two weeks to uh, bring up their spin, uh, you know, lobby to change things. I don't think that would have happened, but of course there would have been the assumption that was going on. Uh, Justice Rouleau said, I need until the 20th before you can get anything. The government agreed and then announced that it would be released to the government and the public at the same time. I'll expect the government to have it for a few hours before it's released. They'll flip through it. But I'm expecting that we will all get to see it on Monday and that even though Monday is a holiday that I'll be working, writing about this. Yeah, looking forward to seeing uh, the results of this report. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Hal.